Manuel Ayao was born in Guatemala, yet his family has long had ties to the United States. In the early 20th century, his grandfather was forced to move to the United States for political reasons. His father, Manuel Ayao Sr., was only five years old at the time. Manuel Sr. later studied engineering at Cornell University and served with distinction as a member of the U.S. Expeditionary Forces during World War I. After the war, Manuel Sr. returned to Guatemala to look after his family's business interests, which had suffered in the earthquake of 1916. Fortunately, his return coincided with a revolution that overthrew the dictatorship which had forced his father to flee. In 1925, his son, Manuel, was born in Guatemala City. Manuel Sr. felt that his children should be educated in the United States. My father wanted all of us to be fluent in English and to know the American way of life. And uh, he was so right about that. Although Manuel Sr. died when his son was only five years old, Manuel's mother honored her late husband's wishes and emigrated with her children to the United States. Manuel attended high school in California, and after a brief return to Guatemala, he went to Canada and made a decision that surprised his mother. I was going to go to college during the war, and my mother didn't want me to come to the United States because I would be drafted. So I went to Canada. Then to her surprise, I volunteered into the Canadian uh, Air Force. When the end of the war was near, Manuel was discharged from active duty in the Air Force and allowed to continue his studies as part of the Canadian Reserve Officers Training Corps. He later earned a degree in engineering from Louisiana State University. Upon returning to Guatemala, he was struck by questions that would have a lasting effect upon his life and work. Since I was uh, a young college graduate looking for work, in Guatemala, my home, I, I was disturbed by the lack of development, by the poverty of, of the people. There was no real occupation for me because there was no industry and I'm a mechanical engineer. So that started me thinking, why, are, why is there no market for my services? Why are, why are the people poor? And this was very early in my uh, in my adult life in the early 50s. And I soon realized that it was our fault that we had a social and economic system that didn't uh, create prosperity. Manuel Ayao's life has been devoted to searching for answers to these questions and finding many of those answers in the classical liberal tradition of Adam Smith Friedrich Hayek, and Milton Friedman. In 1958, after a series of visits to the Foundation for Economic Education in the United States, Ayao founded the Center for Social and Economic Studies to help spread the ideas of freedom in Guatemala. Manuel Ayao has served his country as a member of the Legislative Assembly, a director of the Central Bank, and vice president of the Chamber of Industry. He has been a member of the Mont Pelerin Society since 1964 and served as its president from 1978 to 1980. In 1972, Ayao was the principal founder and founding president of Francisco Marroquin University in Guatemala City, one of Latin America's only independent academic institutions dedicated to classical liberal principles. Students at Francisco Marroquin, regardless of their area of study, are all introduced to the ideas of individual liberty and the free society. Since its founding, Francisco Marroquin University has steadily risen in quality and stature. It is now regarded as one of the finest universities in Latin America, and its highly sought-after graduates can be found in many important political, commercial, and intellectual positions. Manuel Ayao served as founding president of Francisco Morroquin for its first 17 years and carries on a vital relationship with the university to this day. While continuing to struggle for the principles of freedom 
that he holds most dear. Liberty Fund welcomes you to a conversation with Manuel Ayal. Please think back about 20 years to the time you encouraged me to come to Guatemala and see for myself that you really did have a university. Remember that? Yes. I want to learn why you have devoted so much of your life to the cause of liberty, at times uh, at great risk to your person and your family. I was disturbed by the lack of development, by the poverty of, of the people. So that started me thinking, why are the, why are the people poor? And this was very early in my, uh, in my adult life, in the early 50s. And I soon realized that it was our fault, that we had a social and economic system that didn't uh, create prosperity. And in looking into the causes of that, I got more and more and more involved in economics. I realized it was, uh, it was the system that was at fault. The system. It wasn't the people. Mm -hmm. Well, the system under which most of Latin America has lived since colonial times is what Adam Smith called mercantilism, where the governments try to run the economy and they establish privileges, protection for this industry, fomenting that other activity, and trying to allocate resources according to the wisdom of those in, in power at the moment. The result is misallocation of resources on very wide scale. You, uh, you got busy with this task quite early. It, it's clear from things you've written that uh, you became a close student of the um, economics and the socio-political condition of your region and all of Latin America, as a matter of fact, and at the same time a close student of the uh, great scholars who have spelled out the, um, the cause of, uh, of liberty. Well, it was a very intriguing problem because uh, on the one hand you had uh, countries that were wealthy and uh, on the other you had the poor and uh, it, it soon became obvious that it was the system. That, so then I started thinking, how do you change the system? And uh, I realized, I learned by the experience of other people that you have to change public opinion. And that uh, to change public opinion, you start on the top and work down. In the search for an answer to that question, I ran across the history of the Fabian Society in England that established the London School of Economics. In other words, at the highest level of education, they started to teach what they thought was the, uh, the truth. You uh, got a few friends together and organized a center to propagate the principles of freedom. And um, tell me a little about how that all came. Well, I didn't know what the answer to the problem was. At the beginning, I thought there was just uh, uh, bad judgment on the part of the people that were responsible for the running for the decisions of mm -hmm. the government. But uh, later I found out that uh, you can't depend on people uh, with all that uh, power and authority, that you have to let the market operate. In other words, you have to have freedom. Uh, you protect life, liberty, contracts, and then what happens is a market economy. Mm -hmm. Of course, it took a lot of reading, a lot of studying with my friends to come to that realization. It was about that time that I ran across a pamphlet by Ludwig von Mises, which was called My Job. And it related employment and inflation, and it, it was understandable. It was logical. Mm -hmm. It made sense. I went to visit the, the institution that published that pamphlet, which was the Foundation for Economic Education. And there, of course, I found a fountain of learning about the free society. I got very much involved with them. 
and they served as my tutors and mentors and would guide my reading, and in turn I would do that with my friends. Let's go back to Sayus for a minute. Um, when was that established? That's the Center of Social and Economic Studies, Sayus for short. Uh, I started that in 1958, and a few years went by, and then uh, we, we started organizing those seminars in Guatemala. And we invited very prominent people uh, who, at that time, uh, didn't charge very much because they were kind of intellectual outcasts. And uh, later, many of them got Nobel Prizes and became very famous, like Milton Friedman, like Friedrich Hayek, uh, like Ludwig von Mises, Gottfried Haberler, Henry Hazlitt, uh, Hans Senholz, Lean Russell, oh, the whole slew of... Uh, mm -hmm. Even Ludwig Erhard, the ex-chancellor of Germany, uh, came down to help us. That gave us credibility. We were not academics. We were engineers, or farmers, or, uh, storekeepers. We were all entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody was running their businesses, and they were taking a lot of time out of their business to uh, dedicate to this cause. I remember my first visit to Guatemala you drove me to the campus, and uh, on the downtown streets, I saw big piles of shattered plate glass. I asked you about them, and uh, you said car bombs. Very cool about it. Well, th th these were dangerous times, and uh, we had to take a lot of precautions, and I did. Well, it was pretty clear that uh, those were serious times. And um, you could have cut and run, right? <clears throat> That's always an option. And many people do. And many people suffer because they didn't. You mentioned reading von Mises and uh, Hayek and Friedman. Were there others who were influential in your life? In my library, I have uh, uh, five or six pictures of the people that... Uh, I consider it influenced my life the most. First mm -hmm. of all, my father, who although he died when I was five, that same night a, a, a poet, friend of his, wrote a poem about him, which in essence uh, told me how a man ought to be. Mm -hmm. uh, the virtues that a man should possess and his character and all that. So I, I memorized that poem and it's been a great influence in, in me all my life. Then, uh, of course, Leonard Reed of the Foundation Milton Friedman, whose books and, and uh, conversations and assistance uh, helped me a lot. Ludwig von Mises, who, whose books uh, I think are uh, the best books on economics and very profound, very consistent, very coherent. Uh, then Hayek, of course, and all the aspects of law more than economic. Henry Hazlitt, who helped me a lot. Uh, because of his lucid and down-to-earth writing for people that were not uh, trained uh, academically. Mm -hmm. And Bill Hutt. And I think that takes care of my little gallery of uh, my principal mentors. Mm -hmm. So out of all this reading you were doing, you developed uh, the feeling that there was a certain set of principles, that it was absolutely imperative to broadcast and to get people to understand and to accept. Can you run through those principles? Well, let me, let me say first that uh, I came to the conclusion that the, the whole ideological war between communism and capitalism and all the things in the middle would never have succeeded if there were no intelligent, well-intentioned people in favor of whichever position, whatever position. So, therefore, our approach had to be made to the intelligent, well-intentioned people. To the leadership. They always thought that the market was chaotic because it was not directed by somebody. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they had not read a Hayek about the spontaneous order 
and the problems of information. Uh, and uh, so looking at that situation, with, we had decided from very early that we should focus on trying to clear up those subjects to the most, to the leaders of mm. opinion. They were not necessarily the businessmen. They were writers and uh, professors and, uh, and businessmen, some also. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine asked me one time, why don't we buy that particular newspaper? And uh, my answer was, okay, what, if we buy it, who's going to write it? And he said, like a businessman, well, we'll pay uh, the writers to express these ideas. I said, I'm sorry, but you can't pay them. They have to believe them. They have to understand them. I said, I have a better idea. I said, let's make the writers. Back, back me up on the university. Come on board on this project. And if we make the writers, then the newspapers will fight for them so that they write their editorial page. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, that's a long range, too long range product, the mm -hmm. project. I said, tell me about a shorter one. And he came on board, and today we see the editorial pages in the, in the newspapers of Guatemala flooded with uh, editorials written by our guys. Well, at some point in Sayas, the idea developed that you needed more than just publicitarian types of activities to change minds. You really needed to get fundamental and, and have a university, too. Hmm? Well... We were quite busy uh, propagating these ideas through the radio, through uh, articles, through booklets, and through conferences. Actually, uh, we were always trying to organize an audience where we could go and, and, and preach the gospel. Right. And uh, at one point, we, with one of our associates, uh, Rigoberto Juarez Paz, uh, he suggested that, uh, that we should try to take over the economics and law faculty of a particular university, which was having financial problems. Mm -hmm. But they decided to take the decision by unanimous vote, and they had one vote against. Uh, so we were not able to join their board, but then the, the idea came, why don't we start at our own university? And the situation, the occasion was propitious. So our application to start a university was well received by him. Then the government changed, and, uh, and the government that came in was also friendly. Uh, so, uh, as a matter of fact, we had, in the cabinet, we had uh, two, or, two or three of our own trustees. Uh, so, it was quickly approved. And uh, with the opposition, of course, of the, uh, the left-wing government university, which had to oppose it, uh, even as a matter of public relations. Right. And he, but they weren't the only one. No, no, no. They, Among no, the universities who opposed you. No, the worst were the Jesuits. The Jesuits had a university, but, you know, uh, th those were the days when liberation theology was very popular in Latin America. And the Jesuit order was very active in the subversive movements. So they were very much opposed to uh, capitalism, to the market economy, and they opposed us. And they wrote a very damning letter to the government uh, about us. They said you plan to teach a slanted program. Huh? Oh, they, <laughs> they said everything. But they, they were so, uh, so emotional about this that they uh, didn't take into consideration that in the cabinet of the government, uh, two of the ministers were trustees of our university. So this letter damning all the trustees of the university was not well received by the government, and that helped the approval of the university instantly. You know, it just backfired. But when, it, when you implored to become president of the new university, you, you resisted. And that has puzzled me. Well, uh, not being in the academic field, we certainly didn't think we were... Uh, experts. We kind of thought that that was kind of uh, world apart. We were starting a school for this teaching of law and economics, none of which was my professional field. Um, 
But most of us were, the most active ones were just mm -hmm. businessmen. So I thought that the university would not be well looked upon if, uh, if we didn't have a president with the academic credentials. But I, I soon realized, uh, I was made to understand that that was a mistake on my part by an American ambassador who was a friend of mine. Uh, he, he said, you've got to be president of that university because this is a very different university. Nobody will support it if you're not the president because you're known for what you think. That's the only reason people are going to back it up. Otherwise, they'd back other universities. You are well known, you have written, you've exposed yourself. People believe in your sincerity. Right. It's absolutely necessary to raise funds that you be the president. People will know what they're giving their money for. And so that convinced me. So you and came I'm glad then. I did that because <laughs> uh, as the university developed, I realized that to give it the character that it has, it needed to have a, the focus on the problems that I had. I had to bring up the board, you might say, right. and many of my associates, not all of them, because we had Ulysses Dent, who was uh, right on par with me in all our efforts, and Felix Montes, and, uh, uh, and Rigoberto Juarez Paz, and, uh, but besides the small group that, were, that had a communion of ideas, uh, we had to bring up the others. The board meetings at the beginning were half lectures, half meetings. Not only on, on, on economics and what we were trying to achieve mm -hmm. in, in law and economics, but also on, on the philosophy and the pol political economy of the university. But you, when you got started with the university, you had some pretty definite ideas about what should be taught, um, yes, definitely. how the university should be governed. By that time, we were convinced of, of our beliefs, uh, that we were on the right track. And uh, we had a lot of reasons to, be, to have that assurance. Uh, we, by that time, we were well connected with the intellectual conservative movement throughout the world. Uh, and uh, so we felt the secure in our positions. We wanted to, re to teach, for instance, market theory. I couldn't find a professor to teach market theory in Guatemala. The, so I had to appoint myself professor. <laughs> and uh, I taught 17 years uh, economics. And uh, we wanted to teach uh, Hayek, of course, the law, and economics, well, what was the, this, uh, um, the Constitution of Liberty was supposed to be the text that we were going to use. And uh, none of the professors that we were able to hire had ever heard of Hayek. Being a, a scholars, they knew some of Hayek's mentors. I mean, they knew all the Greek philosophers and all the uh, European philosophers that preceded Hayek and uh, liberal philosophers like Hume and Adam Smith and that, but uh, they weren't familiar with the current, with the modern interpretation of classical liberalism. Mm -hmm. And so we had to tell them what to teach. And they didn't like it. We were familiar with the political economy of the university in the U.S., mainly through an article that had, uh, Henry Manny had written in a book published by Liberty Fund, which is called Education in a Free Society, in, in where I learned how uh, the academics had taken over the universities, and I, I learned of the conflict of interest between academics and the running of the university. Uh, and came to the idea that they academics run the universities for their, for the for academics, and then students also, but uh, mainly for academic. And we made the decision that's not going to happen here. You know, the board is composed of businessmen with intellectual interests that have a, 
belief, uh, well-founded in uh, the free society and that are willing to devote uh, the, their time and resources to the university. The uh, university puts a big emphasis also on law as well as economics. Oh, law, of course, because that's, that's the most important thing. I mean, after all, uh, whether you have a free society or not depends on the laws. Uh, where if you have a, I like to define a market economy as that which happens when you protect life, liberty, and uh, contracts. And uh, this, this I think is quite unique. Uh, several things I think are unique. First of all, the university is founded with a purpose like the old religious schools were founded in the United States, like Harvard and uh, all the uh, old time university. Mm -hmm. We founded this university in the belief that the principles of the free society had to be taught to have, to give uh, the students proper culture mm -hmm. and to prepare them to help their country and, and themselves. And we were not establishing a university just to prepare professionals. We figured that professionals must know their trade, but they must also know uh, how a free society works and how it is coordinated by, by the market and the price system, etc. And that's the rule there, isn't it? Oh, that's the no rule. No matter there. what school the student is in, he must take a couple of courses that will acquaint him with the writings of Hayek and Mises. Yeah. So our first task was, uh, where do we get the professors? I remember we had a, a professor of constitutional uh, theory who was a renowned professor of constitutional theory. And uh, he didn't appreciate that the Constitution was to limit the power of government mainly. He thought it was to give the government prerogatives. It was uh, totally upside down. And uh, uh, I, I had to have a professor teaching international trade who thought that uh, trade protection was good. Uh, but he was the best I could find. Uh, I also wanted to teach uh, communism. So I went to the National University where I always maintained good relations, although they were communists, but we respected each other. And this was a very rare relationship, very special relationship. Uh, and I talked to the uh, dean of the school, and I said, look, I want your best communist to come and teach a course on communism in our university. And he said, I'm the best communist, but I'm not going to your university. <laughs> so he sent another fellow, but he couldn't take it. He, he couldn't take intriguing... Uh, in, in inquisitive students, you know. Uh, he couldn't handle that, so he quit. But uh, originally it was my intention that they hear what communism was like from a communist. I, I was not successful in that. At this point, uh, I suspect the university is producing its own professors. Some, yes. And we're producing professors for other universities, which is that much better. Very important. Because we always believed that the idea of um, attending to a growing market of college students should not be done by increasing the size of the existing universities, mm -hmm. but by increasing the number of universities. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also thought that if we did our job well, we would be producing the good professors of the other universities. And with that in mind, we started the graduate school, which was the first graduate school in economics and business in Guatemala. So when we opened, we immediately got a large student body of mature people who, of course, were shocked to hear me expound on economics. And they became prominent intellectual leaders in our society. In your, right. One of them went forth to start a magazine, which was the best magazine in the country for a long time. And so that, that was a lucky happenstance. Mm -hmm. they, to get all the backlog of, of uh, professional people to do postgraduate work. And that way we, uh, we got many professors from other universities. Uh, I started to look for someone who could change the character of the teaching of law. Most 
schools of law teach legislation. And I wanted the focus of our law school to be to teach rights. And um, the difference between that Hayek makes between law and legislation. Right. And uh, I, I couldn't find any of our graduates to, that had gone on in, in that direction. But eventually, we found a, a very intelligent young man, lawyer, who had done postgraduate work in, in the U.S. And he became the dean of law. Now we have the law school like I had dreamed it would be at one time. It teaches rights, economics, and legislation. <laughs> and by far, they are the best paid when they graduate. Well, it's great you've got a law school that uh, recognizes and reflects this information. Uh, but the law school is uh, just one of several schools at the university, right? You're, you're teaching architects, you're teaching doctors. Well, when we started the university, uh, people who were uh, unwilling outcasts of the university system found refuge in our, or sought refuge in our university. And among those were the group of the Salesian priests who wanted to start a school of theology. And uh, we asked them openly, do you know exactly who we are, what we think, and what we intend to do? And, and they said yes. And uh, we've read everything you've written, and uh, we've followed your institution, so uh, we, know, we think we know what we're doing. I said, well, you would be welcome to come, but we have several conditions. One of them is that you have to study market economics. Uh, you have to do, study some law uh, in the Constitution of Liberty, Hayek. And you have to learn English. Now, uh, we will appoint the professors for those courses without consultation with you. Another condition, you have to provide funds to the treasury of the university. We're not going to support you. You're going to help support us. And... Um, you have to be the best. We don't want to be second to none. Now, those are our conditions. If you like them, you're welcome. They came in, and they fulfilled their part. And now they have, after 17 or 20 years, they decided to start their own university. But that university has been greatly influenced by their having been with us for 20 years. Right. So they're... Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, you might say. Then a group of architects came. They said, look, we'd like to start a school of architecture. They said, we want an architect. So I said, well, fine. Same, same deal. Same deal. <laughs> you have to and take market economics law. And the dentist also. Medicine. Medicine, psychology, computer science. That became a very good big school. And the, all the people involved in that science are totally committed to the philosophy of freedom. Now, they've started their own university. So our university, Francisco Marroquin University, is reducing its student body from about 6,000 down to about 2,500 by their leaving, which is the size we wanted it. Because we always thought that the university had to be small in order to have high quality. That the excellence in education depended a lot on the proper selection of students. Mm -hmm. That if we had bad students, the professors would let down their class, and they would disappoint the best students. Um, we did not believe in democratization of education. We think education is for the intellectual elite, and we were proud of it, and we would defend that point of view. We were not, didn't believe in massification of education. On the contrary. We thought that uh, we had to aim at the highest level possible. And, and that this would guarantee us better performance on the part of the professors. Despite that, um, the university grew rapidly. Well, I'll tell you a story, another story. I was having lunch with a left-wing owner of a newspaper, which we, we disagree on practically everything, but we're still 
friends, and we have lunch occasionally. And one day I said, uh, we have the best university. And he said, uh, you're biased. He said, I said, of course not. I have objective proof. He said, well, what are your objective proofs? And I said, well, we reject more students than anybody else. We, we charge higher tuition in the country. That's market recognition. Our students get the best salaries and the best jobs after they graduate than in other universities. So they recover their educational costs much quicker. And fourth, you have your children there, I said. <laughs> <laughs> I clinched them. Very, very good. But that's the way the university grew, beyond the size that we wanted it. This is important characteristic of our university. Since we want it to be run by businessmen, not or professionals, but not academics. That's that's really the requirement. Non, nobody that has a conflict of interest with the measures that a board might take that might be affected by them. Uh, they. We have to have a small university if they're going to get involved in the academic part of the university. The board is involved in what's being taught, and it's very much involved in checking the performance of the professors. Mm -hmm. Now, we have a, a, a uh, disposition in our, in our philosophy, which is published, that the university, and this will shock many ac academicians and professors in the U.S., it says that the university exists in the exercise of the academic freedom of the trustees. And that the university hires professors that agrees with our views. That we respect the freedom of professors to teach otherwise and to teach contrary to what we believe elsewhere with their own money, but not our resources. Because we were forewarned by what you know has happened in many foundations in the United States that went contrary to the founder's intent. We have a mission and we believe in freedom and we teach it. Now we believe in it because it's a value per se but it is also an instrument of progress. It is not an instrument to achieve equality. It is an instrument to achieve well-being. Help people and, pursue their own happiness. And to reduce poverty. Yeah. So we're going against the current, even today. Most of the international uh, aid organizations, including the State Department and the United Nations and many foundations are very are more concerned with the differences in wealth than when doing away with poverty. Mm -hmm. And we say, you have to make up your mind. You can't do both. They're, they're incompatible. If you're going to worry about the differences, you're never going to solve the poverty problem because that is one of the main problems is the lack of capital. Misallocation of human resources. Mm -hmm. It has made slave, tr slave workers out of the worker because a worker lost his bargaining power. He can't go to his boss and say, if you don't raise me, I'll quit, because the boss knows he won't quit. Uh, so they lost their bargaining power, and it's terrible. This is one of the fallacies that we hope our students learn, that wages can only go up as unit labor costs go down. Otherwise, where will the increase come from? There's not enough profits to increase wages around. So the only way to increase the productivity so that unit labor costs go down is through capital and investment. That's the social function of capital, right. to increase the productivity of labor. And then you can pay them more without increasing the prices. Mm -hmm. And. Um, that takes a lot of capital. The amounts of capital that a poor country requires are astronomical. If you multiply, say, $50,000 per job by the number of people that need better jobs, you come up with figures that are much larger than the gross national product of that country. Mm -hmm. So to tax that, that uh, 
the capital that can become the, the income that can become capital, it's, uh, it's the last thing you should do in a poor country. A lot of people were a little bit shocked when you stepped aside and said, uh, um, I propose the election of Fernando Monterroso as my successor. Well, I had been president for 17 years. And uh, I am a good promoter, but not a good administrator. And the university didn't need any more of my type promoter. They needed better administration. Uh, by that time, we had a cadre of uh, young uh, businessmen who understood the philosophy. I had always promised myself I'm not going to leave the presidency until uh, the character of the university is well established. And I felt that it had been. And uh, there is a constant effort to maintain that. Mm -hmm. There are constant reminders that the, uh, the trustees must respect founders' intent. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately, there's still some of us founders around to be able to tell the new trustees that we didn't establish the university to do whatever they wanted, that they joined the, the team if they agreed with our purpose, mm -hmm. that the, it was not obligatory to join only if they wanted to back that type of effort and those aims. And that's the only reason they should be there. From whence came the name Francisco Marroquin that you chose for the university? He was the first bishop of Guatemala. We were invited to a, a, a reunion of philosophers in the city of Antigua, Guatemala, with uh, Rigoberto Juarez Paz, who was the vice rector of uh, Marroquin University. And uh, he's very knowledgeable, he's a good philosopher, and, and uh, I asked him, who was the bust, the person whose bust we were standing in front of. And he said, uh, that's uh, Francisco Marroquin. We didn't have a name yet for the university. And so I asked him, well, who was he? And so he told me he was the first bishop that came with the conquistadores from uh, Spain in the 16th century. And I asked him, well, was he a liberal? He said, yes, very liberal. He defended the uh, human rights of the Indians uh, against the Spaniards, against his colleagues. He founded uh, the first um, higher education school here, the precursor of the National University. And uh, I said, well, he was a good guy. He said, absolutely, he was a good guy. So I said, OK, that's the name. That's the way the name came. And we we're very happy. We even, we even have his, um, his coat of arms on our emblem, with due That's permission. That's the bishop's coat? That's the bishop's coat of arms. The guys who founded Foundation Francisco Marroquin, uh, 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 Clay LaForce, Arthur Kemp, um, and Armin Alchin. Armin Alchin discovered very quickly when they visited Latin America that what people called economics was largely memorization of statistics interpreted with a Marxist uh, view. And so they were very unhappy uh, about that. They knew what you were trying to do, and they thought it was beholden upon them to see what they could do to help you and others like you who all over Latin America were trying to um, teach better ways. How would you describe where the emphasis lies in the teaching of economics at the UFM? Well, first we want our students, our graduates, to understand that the, the free society is not a zero-sum game. And uh, this is explained through the law of comparative advantage, which uh, surprisingly, is absent in most texts on economics, except when they deal with foreign, uh, with international trade. But the, this particular economic law explains the emergence of society, specialization, and that one man's gain is not another man's loss. 
and that therefore it behooves everybody to cooperate and uh, the, the better off are always, uh, always uh, benefited by cooperating with those that are worse off or that have less ability. Uh, in other words, it explains why society exists and it also has a lot of other implications in the distribution of income because, like I said a while ago, uh, in a free market society, the wealth of some is not at the expense of the others. Now, that cannot really be understood unless one understands the law of comparative advantage. I, that was one of the great discoveries that I made in the, in the textbooks of Ludwig von Mises. Uh, that had been expounded by Ricardo at the beginning of the 19th century, but which is really not generally understood. Mm -hmm. Because of the lack of that understanding that also, people don't understand free trade. Now, this is true all over the world. Uh, proof of that is that there are trade barriers all over the world. And this makes it very difficult when I argue against trade barriers because they always come back with, well, everybody does it, you know. Right. And, uh, and that ends to them, the analysis. If everybody does it, it must be okay. <laughs> so everybody makes the same mistake. But it is crucial for an underdeveloped small country like Guatemala to have an open economy. If you don't have an open economy in the United States, it's bad, but it's not as bad because you have a lot of internal competition. You have many automobile factories, many steel mills, many oil refineries, many of, many of everything. Where in our small market, it barely can stand maybe one industry of, of mm -hmm. this and that. So the only competition that the uh, industrialists can have is uh, competition from outside, open borders. Mm -hmm. Then we will be forced to allocate our resources in matter and activities that increase the wealth of the country mm -hmm. and not prevent people from increasing their, from raising their standard of living by buying cheaper outside. Now, this, this brings up another point. In our efforts, businessmen backed me at the beginning because they saw I was defending capital. But as time went by, they also recognized that I was a dangerous to them because I was defending free trade and a free economy. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning that most of our economies are mercantilist economies of the type that Adam Smith uh, criticized in his book. We are. We inherited that from Spain. And businessmen think that the only way to create jobs is for government to protect that industry or that activity or that. And so they think that we're dangerous. They're used to living off that privilege. And when I come out and say, uh, you, uh, instead of fighting in the, in the corridors of the palace for your privileges, go out and fight in the market for the, for the favors of the consumers. They don't like that. So, mm, our support dwindled. I remember uh, the owner of a big factory one time who used to help us. I used to go by every month to collect his contribution. And one day I came and he said, I'm not going to contribute anymore. Because if we follow your policies of free trade, I go broke. <laughs> so I lost that contributor and little by little I lost many others. Uh, businessmen are not um, in favor of the free economy. It's a threat to them. Competition, nobody wants competition. They want free trade for, your, for the suppliers, <laughs> but not for your, your competitors. Mm -hmm. So that is one um, thing that we want uh, our students to understand, that we are not defending uh, private entrepreneurs. We're defending the market economy, where in order to make a buck, you have to increase the wealth of somebody else and thereby bring everybody up. Uh, early on, I, I realized we had a problem with the generalized belief at that time that a planned economy was the thing that we needed. Uh, substitution of imports and government planning of the economy a la socialist system. And so I dwelled into that, and I found surprisingly that no one ever in the world 
have designed a method to allocate resources without a market. Because to allocate resources, you make comparisons of alternatives on the basis of their price. And you don't have prices unless you have private ownership of the means of resources right. and of the things that you exchange. In other words, if you don't have a market, you don't have prices. And you don't have a market if you don't have private property. So that excludes socialism as a rational system. Now, this is another of those globalized fallacies that even the people that were against communism and against socialism thought that it was feasible. They were against it because they didn't like it, but they still thought it was feasible. Now, this was a globalized mistake, which cost millions of lives, of course. But the, the economic planning idea of that sounds plausible to the initiated mm -hmm. because the market sounds chaotic, disorderly, and all that, unless you study microeconomics or you, you study uh, how prices come about. Mm -hmm. So people tend to go to uh, like uh, a planned economy. And this is one of the reasons we started the business school. We wanted to teach economics to the businessman, who is one of the biggest sinners, of course, against the market economy. And uh, he doesn't realize that he is preventing the growth of his own interests by, by adversing uh, the market economy. Uh, and uh, dwelling on that problem, I realized that uh, it's hard for, business, for successful businessmen to listen to economics because, precisely because they are successful in, a, in, a, in the economic sphere, they think they understand economics. But if you put them to a test here and there, you realize that they don't understand a bit about economics. Bankers think that they deal in money, for instance. And I ask bankers, uh, is the interest of the price of money? If they say, of course. Well, it isn't. Interest is the price of credit. They don't have to know monetary theory to become bankers. They're intermediaries between this guy that's got savings and that guy that needs the money. And this happens with uh, all the businessmen. Marketing has a different uh, context in business as it's in economics. Profits and utilities, uh, different concepts, but the same words. Mm -hmm. And they think understanding economics is intuitive if they are successful businessmen. That's the kind of thing we wanted the students to learn, you see. And uh, we question them once in a while to see if, if we're getting the message across. That is, besides the normal things that you have to learn in a career. I mean, the dentists are, have to understand the market. Yeah. They still have to be excellent in fixing teeth. Right. And uh, the priests, they, uh, they asked me one time, why do you want the priests to know economics? My answer was, that's the only thing they talk about in the pulpit. Right. So we want them to know a little bit about what they talk about. Since you took up the war against what you called the system, I have noticed your efforts directed toward people who have just reached the ability to read, such as your little book called How to Make Life Better, simpler even than Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. Your university effort has been aimed at the most intelligent and capable youth that Central America has to offer. And then, as a part of that same effort, as I see it, you took a shot at political leadership and ran for the presidency of Guatemala. Uh, my effort at simplicity, though, was not to aimed at, the, uh, at a lower level of education. It was at the highest level of education. The simplicity, it's a different approach. The little book I wrote on how to raise the standard of living, or how to better your life, or, or the, yeah, how to raise the standard of living, it's the name, um, was aimed again at the intellectual elite. But it, the, the businessmen, like I mentioned before, are not about to read books on on economics, fundamental books on economics, on economic principles, because they think they already understand economics. So it was an effort to aim at that level. 
as well as students, as well as teachers. But it was in a simple way because mo a lot of people don't read. If now, to get the businessman to read that book, I had to one time go and visit a friend of mine who owned a large plantation. And I wanted him to read the book so that he would understand what we were doing in order to gain his support. But I couldn't give it to him and say, look, read this, because it's a caricature and it's a simple thing. So, so I approached him and I said, uh, look, I want to distribute this among your workers, but I'd rather you read it first. Well, then, of course, he read it. And then my detour into political life. Mm -hmm. I, that was not my first experience in, in politics. I had been a congressman in the early 70s. We had approached this party that, that had the um, most probability of winning, and my friends had convinced the president to let me handle the economics. So the candidate asked me if I wanted to be the Minister of Economics or to be in Congress to write up the bills and all of that. So thinking that he would lose, I told him I'd rather go to Congress. So I got on a ticket, on a winning ticket, and I made it to Congress. Actually, he won. But immediately I was cast aside by uh, politicians, mainly, mainly by the people trained by the State Department, who had organized a school for bureaucrats and politicians. Well, after that disappointing experience, I left politics, and I stuck to business and uh, the university. Uh, after I had quit the university, I think two years, two, two or three years afterwards, I was uh, asked to become a presidential candidate uh, for a party, which it was, uh, which I liked, and became the presidential candidate. But in the course of the campaign, uh, we had differences of opinion, especially in the handling of money, and um, so we parted ways, and my campaign was aborted. At that moment, I was invited to be vice president of another party who wanted me as his vice presidential candidate to get the votes that, had, that I had been able to get. And uh, my supporters of the presidential campaign talked to this man and asked him if they would let me run the economy, and he agreed. And by law, the vice president is in charge of the economic cabinet mm -hmm. in our constitution. Mm -hmm. So by being vice president, I would be the chairman of that committee. And so then I ran for vice president. My heart wasn't in it. I didn't want to do it, but I couldn't tell my supporters no. Now, it was quite a challenge to me because <clears throat> I didn't want to lie, and I wanted their votes. And you've learned how to? Well, I, I developed a strategy, and I, I would tell them, look, uh, I have two answers to this problem. The political answer, which you all know is a lie, and the truth. I'll give you the political answer first. Of course, I'm going to solve this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to give you this, and I'm going to give you that. Then I'd end that speech by saying, now you know I'm not going to do that. And I'll tell you the truth. I know how to better the economy so all of you can earn more and then solve those problems that you're asking the government to solve, which can't solve. And that I know how to do, because what we have to do is, and then I'd go into my class on capital formation and increased productivity and all that, in very sim simple terminology. And uh, I found that people followed that, and they liked it. They, they saw that there was sincerity in that, that there was humor in that, and uh, there was uh, seriousness in that, too. Right. Have, has well, more happy. progress been made in a shorter period of time than you I expected? I think we have made tremendous progress. We have not had the coincidence of having the right politician of our points of views. But in the meantime, we have created an infrastructure, an intellectual infrastructure, that supports our points of views. And I remember a story that Dean Russell told me at FEE when I was a young man attending the seminars, 
jokingly, he would say, I don't need to be president. This is in the early 60s or late 50s. So I don't need to be president because if I were president, I wouldn't be able to do what I, would, what I think should be done because the general opinion is not with me. So I'm dedicating my life to change the opinion. And when I change the opinion, then I don't need to be president because whoever gets there is going to do what I... So right. I thought that was a good lesson. So that way I could influence the course of events without getting into politics, even though later I got into politics. Where would you rank Latin America today in terms of freedom on a scale of 1 to 10? Well, of course, with the downfall of communism and the Berlin Wall and the, and the loss of prestige of all of, 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 the, of the left, uh, the uh, liberals, as I'd like to be called them, the, the ones that are for freedom, which in the, here in the United States you call conservatives more, or sometimes libertarians, uh, the, the li true liberals, classical liberals, uh, have gained a lot of ground just because of the disappearance of the, uh, of the left-wing opposition. However, it's not gone because it is not generally understood why, why a socialist and interventionist points of view failed. The, uh, this is one of our, our concerns at the university, that we want people to understand that uh, planning and socialism fails because of a lack of a market, because of a lack of private property. Now, this is not generally understood. Uh, so that hasn't made much progress, but they are ahead because of the absence of the of the opposition. In other words, the field has been left vacant by the, all the provocateurs of the left. They have also lost financial backing. The violent left has lost financing all through Latin America, and they used to be very powerful because they could intimidate a whole society. Remember, they started revolutionary movements throughout Latin America, and uh, that is gone. And so the people who were maybe inhibited from speaking out today do speak out and come out and write and that. So we've made a lot of progress. Unfortunately, like I say, the understanding of the free society is still very little. I think we have made uh, great progress in Guatemala and in Chile. There's, uh, but in many other countries, there is not that much understanding. What do you see, Moso, as the major threats to continuing progress in Latin America? Some of the persistent lagging conceptions regarding social order. Uh, and uh, they're hard to change. For instance, the, um, the fact that we cannot have a rule of law based on generality. We don't have a law or, or a system that would say, for instance, uh, nobody, there will be no law or no law should have effect if it allows some people to do something that anyone else cannot do under the same conditions. Now, I've asked businessmen and people to see if they would like such a provision in the law. And offhand, off the top of their mind, they say yes. But when they think about it, they say no. In other words, they do not want general rules of just conduct to prevail as a maxim of lawmaking. Now, if we don't have that, we don't have a market economy. And if we don't have a market economy, we don't have an efficient economy. Now, the, the labor lobbies are not strong enough to prevent a rule of law of that type to be established. The church is not. The military are not. Uh, and all the other lobbies, they are not uh, powerful enough to prevent the adoption of, the, of those rules of conduct but the businessmen are. Uh, they realized that if we had rules, laws that applied equally to all, it would end all privileges. <laughs> and they'd be up a creek. <laughs> <laughs> they'd have to earn an honest living, like they say. But uh, 
they, they have to earn their, 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 their incomes in the market, in competition, mm -hmm. because they would not be able to exclude other people from doing exactly the same things that they are doing. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this refers to all kinds of privileges, and mainly uh, tariff protection and quota that are distributed among uh, uh, businessmen by the Ministry of Economy. And if we cannot do away with the tariff protection, we won't have a competitive economy. And we will have all the losses associated with misallocation of resources, which are tremendous, mm -hmm. which will impoverish any, any small country. Uh, it's enough to keep us poor. We have other obstacles that by themselves uh, will keep Latin America backward for some time. Although there has been a great amount of progress, there's still this infrastructure of, of mercantilism that will not let it get out of its rut. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, nowadays they, can't, uh, they don't attack the capitalism anymore, they attack the globalization or neoliberalism. Uh, the people that are against the free society always have to find a punching bag, a straw man that they can beat up on. Now it's globalization and you saw all the disturbances in Seattle and in uh, Brazil and in Switzerland. And um, the schools of economics are at a loss to teach why globalization is the natural and normal state of affairs. Mm -hmm. It's not an imposition of a policy. It's the removal of, a, mm -hmm. of an obstruction. Right. I mean, after all, the, the Lord made only one world and the frontiers are arbitrary imposed by force. So globalization is just uh, going back to the original design where people can uh, exchange with each other and have mobility of capitals and uh, goods and hopefully people, and it's opposed. It's opposed by the left. They're nihilists. Yeah. And the other whipping is uh, environmentalism. Uh, but they are using those two themes to combat the free society, to destroy private property or right f or freedom of people. Now, those are the two greatest uh, issues right now mm -hmm. that should be combated in, uh, in schools. And universities should be able to get into those topics. But remember, most universities are still very interventionist, if not socialistic. Right. Some of them have come to, uh, to our side. But, but it's a long fight, and I hope we stay lucky as we have been so far.